Thank you very much. I'm humbled and it's a privilege to talk about the fight against Ebola on behalf of so many thousands and thousands of people who have been involved in that. When you think about Ebola, you think about Africa. But the first thing I would like to remind you of is that Ebola affects a very small part of Africa. This is the map of Africa. If I zoom in like this, you will see that it's these three countries here, Guinea, Sierra Leone and Liberia, that has suffered this severe outbreak. It was stopped swiftly in Senegal, in Nigeria and in Mali. So three countries already have cleared themselves from Ebola. Eh? And it started here, in the southern, more, very remote part of Guinea. These are the poor corners of these countries, and it spread like this. The other parts of Guinea crossed the border to Sierra Leone and to Liberia. And let's look at the time in Liberia. Here is another graph. It shows the month. Lebo uh, Ebola started in uh, Liberia in March. And this shows the number of cases on average per day. We count over a three-week period. This was not even one case a day. It was one case a week. It was quite low levels all the way through May, June. It was in July. It climbed up to about five cases per day on average. And then came the catastrophe. And that was because the virus has made it into the poor slums of the capital. In the rural areas, it was slower to move. But when it came into the capital, it increased like this. This was the terrifying curve. You can see it goes straight up like this. And in September, it hit above 50 new cases per day in the country. And by then, most of those cases were in the capital. And the reason it could take off like this was that Ebola was also spreading out from the capital to remote rural areas because people travel a lot. And the spread, which we call exponential, is explained by the seemingly simple but cruel fact that one person infects two others on average, and those two infect two others, and then two others. So the increase will not be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It will be one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-eight, you know, and sixty-four, hundred and twenty-eight. It goes straight up like this. No country can sustain an increase like this. And at this level, Médecins Sans Frontières, who had done a great job in the beginning, say, we are not enough. We cannot do this. Others must step in. And it took a time for the international community, even if they started swiftly, it was the national doctors and nurses who put in the next treatment unit. But at this stage, in August, beginning of September, was that people were even dying on the streets because there were not beds enough for treating them. And it's so crucial that they get isolated. And the treatment unit that turned it around here was actually the World Health Organization with Dr. Atai from Uganda, who did an effort, almost heroic effort, and took care of everyone, so no one more was on the street. And when I came, I joined the response here, in the second part of October. It seemed as if it had turned around, but there was a lot of discussion about that. Perhaps, many said, who were critical in their thinking. Perhaps it's a failure of the data to capture a reality. Perhaps it's poor people now who lose their dear ones and they don't call the response. They have secret funerals at home. And there were indeed some few secret funerals. At that time, a very important study was done by Justin Moeda from the African Union and by Center of Disease Control, where they talked with the undertakers, the funeral homes, and with the religious leader, and they really tried to estimate how many secret funerals there were. And it was not enough to explain the turnaround. We also could see that the Red Cross was actually collecting and finding fewer dead bodies. So many indication was that it was turning around, and that was indeed my conclusion in my first work with this data. Because what happened to me was I came to the country, didn't really know what I would do. I walked into the Minister of Health and the head of epidemiological surveillance, Luke Bauer here, he said, you are the type of person we need, come join me. And I became deputy head of epidemiological surveillance in 20 minutes and I got my own desk. <laughs> 
and very nice people to work with. Lucky for me, lucky for me, Margaret Lamuna came around and taught me the specifics of Ebola. I had dealt with a lot of other epidemic outbreaks during the time when no man heard about me when I did decent research in Africa. You got to know me when I appeared on the internet, but that's another part of my life, you know. Now, what I really want to show here is what we did on the whiteboard behind us. Look here. This is trying to analyze the flow shot of the data. This contagiosity of disease made it very difficult even to transport a form on which data was collected. Even to try to use cell phones that had been in the family you couldn't do. So data came from laboratory, from Ebola treatment units, they came from the community, from burial data, from the Red Cross, and from rumors. And then we had different persons in the team in the Ministry of Health. These were all government employees, and you can see the names, what they were doing. It was Dikena, Nelson, Mohammed, Stephen, Mike, Trocon, and Faith there who worked with it. And then they put the data together. The database collapsed the 10th of September. The database for Ebola was done for 50 to 100 cases, and we had thousands. So we had to go over to a software which you may have heard about. It's called Excel. We were... <laughs> We were running it like Excel, and people were compensating the lack of database by hard work. This is Mohammed Dunbar, late in the evening. There was, even the ministry had to save diesel, so the electricity switched off at 6 o'clock in the evening. He's catching the last daylight, and in front of the map of Liberia, he's entering the data in Excel here. So what was lacking in technology was added in motivation. And it was also very motivating and inspiring to work with the national response. It was strange for a professor from the Academy of Science of Sweden to stand here beside Major Maurice Hu from the People's Liberation Army of China and Commanding General Gary Woleski from the 101st Airborne Division of Kentucky and be teammates with those militaries. <laughs> I never thought I would be there. And they really helped out. They provided treatment units, logistics, and even people who know how to deal with Excel who work closely with us. <laughs> Very, very important. And most of all, most of all, with deep respect and admiration how the government handled this. This is my selfie, you could say, these days, when I present the data for the president here in the Saturday afternoon meeting with the council, the important ministers on this side, and here the representatives of the international organization. What I liked in Nigeria is that the divisions of task was clear. The experts presented to the government the government listened to the expert and to the people, and they made the decisions. Eh? But they listened to us, and then we implemented it. And that, that works. So it was greatly stimulating to work. And what happens then? Well, what happens was day by day, it looks easy here, but it was, it was quite dramatic for us to see the curve fall like this, from 50 in October down to 10 per day in December. And by then, we had another problem. People were saying, wow, it will be over for Christmas. No, 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 Margaret and other experts said this. That's not how Beobola behaves. This is a mighty enemy. It ends as it started, slowly, slowly. And it will bump and bump in the end. And this is really what happened. You had, you had, sorry, you had to continue to work. This effort up here was like the fire brigade stopping a wildfire. You needed to have the Ebola treatment unit with all these heroic nurses and doctors. You needed to have the burial team who helped people to get dignified burials, you know, and yet safe. And you needed to have the teams who could discuss with them to identify the contacts and follow the contacts. And you needed to talk with people. This poster is just one example. Media was important. Even I had some sessions when I spoke in the radio to the people. Because people want to hear different persons telling them. Very important was the religious leaders. That with almost no exceptions, just the very few exceptions, really supported this. And community leaders at large and many sort of, of non-governmental organizations did the right thing. And what happens was this. It went down and down and down. But can you see how equal it is? Just one case a day here before the big catastrophe in September, October, and then came down to five in December, to two a day, and then one a day throughout February. During the catastrophe, when we had the fire brigade out fighting, then we counted number. 
during this period, the second phase, when we had to go to zero, we didn't use numbers, we used names. We had to get to know people. We had to respect people. We had to gain their confidence. And I can tell you how this ended in Liberia. This is not my data. I presented it from the Minister of Health and many other people who have done the work. But all cases that appeared in Liberia in this year came from this one woman who got sick the 28th of December. And unfortunately, she had not gained the trust and confidence in the system. So she stayed at home with her fever and her vomits and hoped that it was malaria or something else. And by doing that, unfortunately, she infected five other persons. So in the beginning of January, a neighbor developed Ebola, the son, the husband, a daughter, and a herbalist that she went for treatment to. One person created in less than two weeks five other persons. And look here. The neighbor infected his sister and brother and also the niece. The son infected the brother. The husband infected six other persons. Nephew, daughter, two persons who helped him to a taxi in the end. And another neighbor here and a friend. So this is like a sinister family tree. Eh? The vir virus transmits in the closest relation you have in life. Those who help you when you are sick. From one to five to ten. But at this stage, the response had got it. They had gained the confidence. The best team there from the Montserrat or the Monrovia team came there. Moses Baidoa and Musaka Fala led this work, you know, to try to gain the confidence and they got the list of all the contacts, and they followed the contacts. And the good thing with Ebola is that the first one to two days when you get symptoms, you are very little risk of infecting others. It's not completely safe, but the risk is very low. And if you just isolate people that the first one to two days, then you can stop the transmission. And what happens was this. This person who helped into taxi, he infected a health worker. This infected a fiancé. The nephew infected the wife. The brother here infected the housemaid and the sister. And the niece there infected her grandmother. And she got sick the 19th of February and was discharged the 5th of March. Because now I will show you who died and who survived. All these which I show as black hair, they died. In the beginning of this micro outbreak, you know, they came late. And they also died to a very high extent. Here more survived. Out of these last six, it was four who survived and two who died. You can see how you gain the confidence. Just one person resulted in that. And then we thought it was the end. We thought it was over here. But the 20th of March on Friday, when I was on the commute to Tain in Sweden, it said ping in my pocket. And I got two text messages within 10 minutes and then an email from Margaret. And it told us one new case in Liberia. And of course, we were saddened, but we were prepared. We knew it could come. We knew that the per program, uh, the system may not have been perfect. And this female, 44 years, she unfortunately had 43 contacts. They are already listed. I've spoken last night with Luke Bauer, who is head of epidemiological surveillance. The best persons are there doing exactly what you do. The African Union were involved and really got this. The team led by Joshua Wanje, who was head of the work in Lagos, in, La in Nigeria, is supporting uh, the African. And they are now at this the best they could do, but we don't know from where it came. In a few days we will know. This woman unfortunately is so uh, upset and so sick, so she hadn't given the detail yet. And what everyone has learned now is not to force people, is to respect them in their tragedy and in their difficulties and wait until we can get to know what is really happening. So will this work? Look at the map here. We have indeed one more case in Monrovia. There is a few cases. This is the last 21 days in rural Guinea, but otherwise it's concentrated around the capitals in Sierra Leone and Conakry. The big drop has already taken place in Guinea and Conakry. They are just like two months behind Liberia. And what makes me convinced that Ebola will stop, I won't tell you the month. 
It can be in six weeks, it can be in nine months. It doesn't matter because it's led by competent African people now with the right assistance internationally and they know what they are doing. Look at Tolbert Nuanswa, who is head of the Ebola response in Liberia. The 5th of March, he was interviewed in BBC. And it would be tempting to him to say, hooray, we've done it, it's over. But he didn't say that. You can see his face, how serious it is. He told everyone, it's not over until it's over. Thank you very much.